immediately the man was healed and recovered his strength and picked up his pallet and walked. Now that day was on the Sabbath. Would you do me a favor and look at your neighbor and give your neighbor my message title for this morning? Can you muster up all of the energy you have and look them dead in the eye and tell them to get up off your mat? Off your mat. If you didn't say it like you believe that that thing was going to come up out of them. I need you to look at your neighbor in the eye and I want you to tell them to get up. right now just giving your name praise adoration and glory we thank you god that you've already stirred the pool here god now i ask right now god as i have emptied myself up that you will fill me with your spirit may every word that precede my lip be kissed by you god may it pierce the heart of your people oh god may their lives be transformed and may they leave here not the same way in which they came. we give your name praise adoration and glory for the provision that has already been made now be with us this morning oh god and do what only you can do as you can do it in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen, amen, and amen. amen. We gotta shout in expectation. Like we expect God to do what God said he was going to do. So here we find a very familiar passage of scripture. This is a story that many of us have heard preached probably more times than we can count. But what I found is what happens is that many of us as believers compartmentalize Christ. When we've heard the same thing over and over again, we kind of pass it off as just something to be dropped in this box. There are the times that Jesus did exorcisms. We compartmentalize them and put them in this box. There are times when Jesus gave parables. We put them in this box. There are times when he has done miracles. We put them in this box. But, but today I'm asking that you would put away everything you've already heard about this story and to allow yourself to look at it through a new set of lenses. See, when we read the word of God, we can't read to just read. We have to read and say, Lord, release a fresh revelation that I may see into your word something I've never seen before, that it would transform my life, that, that it would improve my character, that it would increase my capacity, that it will increase and enhance my faith, that I can better serve you. And so today, if you would, let me kind of walk you through this text and release to you what the Lord released into my spirit with a fresh revelation about this particular story. So let me set the stage for you. Here we find Jesus in Jerusalem are on his way to celebrate a holy day. And the text doesn't tell us what that particular holy day was, but we know that that's where he was going. And then at the entrance of the city, there was this sheep gate. If you will, this sheep gate was kind of like a hub. Downtown LA, it was a commercial industry type place where there was hustling and bustling and exchanging going on and communication. It was life and vitality. People were coming to get, people were taking away. And so you find this, this sheep gate being this sort of metropolis where life was happening. And then on the other side of this sheep gate, we find this pool of Bethesda. The pool of Bethesda, which in Hebrew means the house of mercy, had five porches. And each of the porch, there was a designated affliction. And these crowds of sick people were congregating on this porch. They were congregating there because they were waiting for something to happen. Now, it's important to note that in this time, historically, there were no Kaiser Permanentes, there were no Cedar Sinai's, there were no urgent care centers, there was no primary care physician, there was no urgent care, and I say that already, there was no place for people to go. So this pool of Bethesda became this kind of holding place for people who were not quite dead, but not quite alive either. They were in this place of survival. Stay with me. In the very obscure scene, because on one hand we have this sheep market where vitality and life is 
we're weary, we're tired, and, and some of us who would never have been out of your mouth feel hopeless. Shoot! 
those who are dying for. But we have to make it up in our mind that surviving just won't do. Here we find this man who spent 38 years of his life bound by his affliction. Even though he was of close proximity to where life was happening, he still was in a place of mental, physical, spiritual affliction. He was bound to his affliction. And that being bound to this affliction caused him to operate in dysfunction. See, dysfunction breeds dysfunction. He spent 38 years with people who were just like him. Broken, lame, blind, paralyzed. Even though life was happening right next to him, what was in his circumference was what kept him bound. He couldn't see past the other people on the porch. And so what was dysfunction became life for him. And when you begin to operate in dysfunction as life for you, you develop this sense of comfortability. Amen. I'm comfortable here. There are people like me around you. And we're doing okay. We had to have been. He was there for 38 years of his life bound to a porch while life was happening. That's like many of us. We were spiritually dysfunctional and life is happening all around us. But we can't participate in that because what's around me solidifies that it's okay to stay broke. I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about spirit. If you look at your environment, just, just take a moment to examine the people closest to you. Most of the times we are bound to people who are like us because we are what we attract. How do I know that? Because I lived it. I spent years in dysfunctional relationships because I didn't want to deal with the brokenness that was me. And so I attracted people who were even more broken than I was. So I spent my time trying to fix you so I didn't have to deal with me. And then I kept people around me who weren't doing no better than me because it made me feel better about I can preach to somebody today. Because it's a lot of work to pretend. Yeah. 
get to the surface. Because what's in you is always going to come up. But what we do is we just push it back down. Put our nice coat on and keep going. And as the Lord began to pull this stuff out of me, it wasn't pretty. Those were some of the hardest days of my life. Because I had to face me. And then I found myself fighting with God because he, he was dealing with me about being so prideful. And I said, Lord, that's not true. Because I've been delivered from that. You know, now I'm a recovered hater. I had to re recover from that. Okay. I used to be a little jealous of people. I've been recovered from that. A little judgmental. I've been recovered from that. And so, you know, I'm just feeling really good about myself because I'm recovered. I mean, that's three big things. I stop hating, stop being jealous, and stop judging. Now, I wanted to get a little sticker on my little chart of heaven knowing that I have been delivered. So when the Lord said to me, but you're still dealing with pride, I said, Lord, that is not true. Now, we need to go back to look at some of this stuff because I have been delivered from this prideful stuff. And so I had to get up off my knees and pray because I just couldn't believe that he was really telling me that I was still dealing with something I knew I had been delivered from. And the Lord said to me, he didn't even have to say it because he started to give me these visions of times. And the Lord said it didn't leave you. It was dormant that has manifested itself in another way. A spade is still a spade, whether it's right side up or upside down. And, and it, it, it brought me back to my knees because I did not know. And, and I say all that to say that it's work to deal with you. It's work. And many of us would rather just continue to pretend than to just say, this is me, all of me. I'm broken. I'm bruised. I got some scars. But he still loves me. There's nothing that nobody can do about it. But we walk around more concerned with somebody else's perception of who we are than to walk in the authenticity of who God has created you to be. My son is 12 years old. I tell him all the time, I said, Dakar, I said, you are wonderful. You are beautiful. You are intelligent. And I said, nobody can ever discount that which God has already given you. See, people can say, your mama said that because she's your mother. But you can't dispute God. And if I put that in, that means that anybody that got anything to say about him, he's going to say, you can deal with my God about it because he said, I wasn't just good. I was very good. And the same way that God thinks about my son is the same way he thinks about you. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you survive. It doesn't matter how you live. God will never love you any more or any less than he does right now. And the thing about God is that he knew about your mess before he came to save you from it. So if you begin to walk in the fullness of God's love for you, you can do away with the And so here we find this man stuck in his dysfunction for 38 years. Being complacent because everybody else around him was. At some point, we have to begin to make up in our minds that enough is really enough. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I really don't care about your life circumstances and situations. God wants us to live. Yes, yes. Live. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I've wasted enough of my days that I cannot afford to waste anymore. Because none of us know when our time is over. We could not wake up tomorrow and what did we do with what God had given us? So we have to decide that we have to stop surviving. I'm just tired of surviving. I got to do more than that. 
The second thing you have to do is you got to ditch the excuses. Do away with them. D destroy them. If we go back to verses 6 and 7, It says, when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? The invalid answered and said, no. He said, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm coming to get in it myself, someone else steps down ahead of me. There are two points I want us to consider at this point in the text. One is the question Jesus asked, and the second part is his response. Yes, yes, yes. So all the, all the people that are out there, Jesus selects this one man. We don't know why he selected him. It just happened to be his day. And so Jesus approaches this man who's sitting at this healing sanctuary and he asks him what appears to be a rhetorical question. He says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get At first glance, I had to ask myself, why would Jesus ask this man who is clearly afflicted who is sitting on this porch, who knows how long he's been on that porch, does he want to get well? See, we must understand that in this moment that it stresses Christ's divine sovereignty, because he already knows, but it also calls for human responsibility. See, Christ approached him in the sovereignty of who he is, but he spoke to the importance of this man's will to his deliverance. Amen. So, stay with me. It could be possible that the 38 years had paralyzed this man's soul. Yes, yes. That Jesus wanted to check and make sure if he really wanted to get free. Yes. Some of us have become so comfortable in dysfunction that it scares us to, for the possibility that we could be free. When you've been doing the same thing for a very long time, it, it, it could be a little scary to step out. I was in a dysfunctional relationship with this God who loved me to the best of his ability, but it was dysfunctional. And I was with him for a very long time. Even though I knew it was dysfunctional, the mess that I knew was more comfortable for me than having to start over. So I stayed. Amen. Amen. Many of us have that same attitude about the other things in our life. Yes. We've gotten so comfortable in the dysfunction that it has become a way of life for us. And even though we know it's dysfunctional, the dysfunction that we know that we're comfortable with is safer for us. Then to step out to get home. And, and, and so T.D. Jakes makes this point. When you think about the question, do you want to make home? T.D. Jakes makes this point where he said, now if you were on the porch for 38 years, and Jesus says, do you want to get free? And your response is, well, I don't have nobody to put me in the pool. In my mind, everybody on the porch is not lame. Now, you miss 38 seasons, and you wait for the angel to come before you decide to start moving. Amen. Wow. Now, if it were me, Whoever I'm talking to say, look, your eyes don't work, but I can guide you. Get me to the next 
because nobody was there to help him. That sounds familiar. Yes, it does. Yeah. We stay in the dysfunction, and then when somebody calls you out on it, you got an excuse why you're there. That's an indication that you just might not want to get free. Because when somebody points out something in you, it has to come from a place of love because they want to see you better. But I can't want better for you. And you not want better for you. So for 38 years, you sit on this porch waiting. I wonder how much longer he would have stayed there. But while life is happening over here, I'm dying over here. And I'm okay with it. That's the thing about our dysfunction. The longer we stay, what we're really saying is, God, I'm okay. I'm okay with being dysfunctional. And so while we're waiting for God to do his part, God is really waiting on us to do ours. And here's the thing. When you've done what God has already called you to do, you worship while you wait. Yes. 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 You praise while you wait. Because the bigger your worship, the less focus you have on anything outside of God. Because our worship is about Him and for Him. And many of us have been overtaken by our circumstances because we have not learned how to worship. Worship is the access. It is the entry. It is, the veil has already been split for us to enter his gates. Yes. To come boldly to his throne. Wow. And then because we're looking like this, and not from the eyes of our heart, but our faith and what the God, word of God has already told us, we find ourselves staying longer in places we had no business being in the first place.
when you sit under the word of God, you should be convicted. Something should stir on the inside of you, but it should cause you to turn the other way. But not sit in the conviction because the Bible says there is no condemnation. But to say, Lord, you love me anyway and I'm going to do better from today. What has happened has already happened. And many of us are still living in what already happened. That hurt from 20 years ago that somebody did to you, let it go. Amen. Dissension in your family over things that are trivial, let it go. If we spent as much time fussing and fighting, loving people, the world would not be in the condition that it's in. And so, I say all that to say this. When Christ asks of us to do something, we must respond in obedience. Amen. Let me get back to the text. So we're going to worship and pray until God releases it. We're not going to wait past it. We're going to be active in our waiting. But the second part was the excuse. And I want to just spend a few moments dealing with the excuse. When Jesus asked him, did he want to be well, he never responded to the question. He gave the excuse. He, he basically said the reason why he had stayed afflicted for 38 years was because he didn't have anybody to put him in the pool. Which, which goes back to my earlier statement, why you get a little bit closer every year. And then two, how did you get to the pool to begin with? Could you not have called them? Right? So, he gives the excuse, and the excuse is really the outpouring of the dysfunction. Dysfunction is internal. But it manifests itself externally. Right? And it can manifest itself in a number of ways. I'm not going to talk about anybody because I don't want anybody to be offended. But I'm going to talk about myself. The way that my dysfunction showed itself is because I'm overweight. Oh, that hurt. What, what I found is that I didn't recognize that my response to challenge was to eat. But it wasn't the food. It was the fact that I was able to control some area of my life when I felt out of control in another area. Wow. Yes. What's on the inside of you is going to show up. Right. It may not be your weight. It could be your addiction to alcohol. It could be cigarettes. It could be overspending. It, any place in your life where there is excess is an indicator that there is some dysfunction. And what we try to do is we try to mask the dysfunction with the excess. Because it's always something that we can control. And so we have to understand that our internal struggles do come up and they show up. But for people who are actually looking, because you can go around and say, I'm cute and I'm thick and I'm okay. But the reality is that it's still a reflection of my spiritual condition. If my temple, if this is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, how comfortable is He inside of me? If I'm eating what I want to eat, drinking what I want to drink, I'm talking about non-alcoholic beverages, don't go tell nobody that lie, I'm deliver from that too. <laughs> but if this is the place where the Holy Spirit dwells, would you be comfortable living in you? And it doesn't have to just do what you put in your body. It's also what comes out your mouth. Right. People who are overly critical, we know those kind of people. Yeah, I've been delivered from that too. People who are jealous, but 
delivered from that too. People who just always got something to say. Do you know that kind of people? Nobody asked you. Nobody's even talking to you. But you just see no always got I mean, you just Now, that ain't never been me, so I need to be delivered from that. But Do not have a heaven or hell to place you in. 
And the moment we get free of somebody else's opinion, because see, what happens is we become who people need us to be, and then we become who people want us to be at the expense of who God has called us to be. And so we have to say, no fear. I'm going to be all of me and all of my complexity and all of my crazy. Because we all got a little bit of it's okay. It's okay. We all got a little bit of that crazy. So crazy is crazier. But we all got a little bit of that crazy. And there is somebody out there who's going to love you and all the crazy. And so he responds with the excuse and because he's assuming that Jesus wants to help him get to the pool. See, his excuse was also another indication of his spiritual condition because he didn't even recognize who Jesus was. It's much, it's much like the woman at the well. She, she thought Jesus wanted to get her some indoor plumbing. Where is this living water at? But it was a reflection of her spiritual condition that she could not recognize that the Messiah was standing right in front of her. And so when Jesus approaches the man, the man too does not recognize him. That's why he responds with, I need some help getting in the pool. Are you going to get me near the pool? But what Jesus was offering him was so much more. If it was more than just a dip in the pool, he was offering a gift, that gift of living water, where you will hunger and thirst no more. It was that gift he was offering him. And so Jesus said to him in verse 9, he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. We have to be prepared to respond in obedience. Immediately the man took up his bed and walked because his human responsibility was fulfilled when he responded in obedience. He, he didn't just get healed from the affliction, but his strength had been restored. And if you're laying out for 38 years, you can imagine what your body must look like. Just deterioration, physiology, physiology, Physi come on somebody help me, physiology, thank you, got tongue twisted there, but his body was weak, but when he responded in obedience, he got way more than he asked for, ooh Jesus, I feel Jesus, because when we do what God has told us to do, God will give us more than what we asked him for. It pays to obey. And we don't obey to get paid. We obey out of our love for the Savior. When you love him and know how much he loves you, you know that he would never take you any place where his grace can't keep you. He would never let you walk anywhere where he hadn't already gone before you. And so when you trust God, then you're able to say yes to whatever it is that you ask me to do, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. of this particular miracle story. It was anti-climatic. Jesus didn't pray for him. He didn't speak in no tongues. He didn't knock him, he didn't push him into the water. He didn't give him no principles for daily living. He didn't give him no money or no handouts. He spoke to the potential in him. He said, pick up your mat. See, the potential was already in him. That was his responsibility. Because God will not do for you what you will not do for yourself. So his human 
responsibility in conjunction with his obedience to the Savior extended to him the miraculous healing that he needed. And it wasn't just strength for his bones. His spirit got well. His mind got well. And his body responded to what his spirit and his mind had received.
somebody. But, but I said all that to say that God is ready to make us whole. Amen. And so I want to open up the altar. But before I open up the altar, I want you to take a moment to just think about where you are. Because here's the thing, Sunday after Sunday, we come and stand here. We are emotional. We've been moved. But it didn't prick our hearts. When your heart is pricked, is the moment you decide to do something else. I didn't come for all of you, but I came for some of you. And I believe that the revelation of this word that the Lord just released in this house was for some of you. And what God is really asking you is to just take his hand. You don't have to figure it out. Because we're living in a world that was already finished. So before we open the altar, and we're going to come to the altar, because we're saying, Lord, if you release the fire, burn everything in me that is not like you. you to feel with everything that is like you. Because today I've decided not because I'm emotional, not because this is my song, but, but I, I'm making a decision today, God, that this word was confirmation for what you've already been speaking to me. See, this word was a revelation for some of you who aren't ready yet. It was the seed that God's going to water. And then you're going to get the increase. But for some of you, this was the water on that seed. And God is saying, what is your human responsibility? And are you going to choose to respond today? The altar is open. The altar is open. If you are tired of surviving and you are ready to pick up your mat today,